Great. Well, thanks so much for having me this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I was asked to talk about hereditary gastric cancer. And for clarification, I, I know this is a symposium on gastric and esophageal cancer. Most of what I'm going to talk about today um, when I say the term gastric cancer would probably also include um, cancers of the junction between the stomach and the esophagus. More, tr more traditional upper esophageal cancers honestly rarely have a hereditary component um, and so are a little bit outside of the scope of what I'm going to talk about today. But if I use the term gastric, I'm really talking about gastric and gastroesophageal junction type of cancers. Um, so I have no financial disclosures um, uh, to point out here. Um, so it was a brief outline for the talk. I'm going to start with just some high school biology level um, cancer genetics 101, just to ensure that we're all speaking the same language. So if I use certain terminology, hopefully what, you know what I'm referring to. Um, I'll then spend most of the, the second half of the talk talking about uh, specific hereditary syndromes um, that we see or that we try to work up in the cancer genetics clinic, how we then manage and screen and um, reduce the risk for people with certain forms of inherited risk. Then I'll start, uh, then I'll finish with um, a couple of minutes um, talking about who should be considering genetic testing in the context of a gastroesophageal cancer diagnosis. Um, so just as some very basic background here, all cancers really by definition um, have quote unquote mutations. And most of the time when we're talking about mutations in cancers, um, when you hear later today about mutations um, for targeted therapies, we're mostly there talking about non-inherited or what we would call somatic mutations, um, mutations that are in the tumor but not in the person themselves. Um, so, so I think most of the time when you hear um, cancer biologists, um, ca uh, oncologists, et cetera, talking about mutations in the cancer, they're, they're not quite using the same term of uh, mutation that we use on um, the inherited genetic side. Um, and you know, we've learned over the years that anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of cancers, if you look across the entire spectrum of cancers, are probably arising in the setting of specific hereditary factors, inherited mutations um, in the DNA. Now, that, that fraction looks very different cancer to cancer. Ovarian cancer is probably more than 20 percent um, of ovarian cancers are arising in the setting of specific hereditary factors. And on the other end of the spectrum would be something like lung cancer, where it's probably less than 1 percent. Um, and we'll get into some of the numbers specifically for gastroesophageal cancer, at least to the best that we understand it. Um, but when we talk about genetic testing for inherited risk, what we're really looking for are specific inherited mutations in specific cancer risk genes where when mutated, when altered, therefore um, predispose that individual to increased risks of a certain cancer or usually more than one cancer. Um, so cancer is an inherently genetic disease. Um, all of us have um, the same 30,000 or so genes present in every cell of our body, whether that cell is a normal cell or whether that cell is a cancer cell. Um, your cancer cells contain the same genes as your normal cells, but really what distinguishes a normal cell from a cancer cell are what genes are turned on and what genes are turned off. And if, you, and if a cell acquires essentially the wrong combination of genes that are on and off, that cell then grows and replicates in an unregulated fashion, and that's what makes a cancer cell a cancer cell as opposed to a normal cell. So when we talk about genetic mutations, again, regardless of whether we're talking about inherited mutations or these acquired somatic mutations, it's basically some sort of alteration in the normal DNA sequence. Um, your DNA is read by the, the machinery within a cell to create a protein. Um, so a normal DNA sequence within a given gene, um, the cell machinery should basically translate that into a specific protein. And if that DNA sequence is normal, that protein is normal. And by contrast, if there's a mutation or an alteration or some sort of disruption in the DNA, again, whether inherited or acquired, um, then the protein that's produced is either non-functional, dysfunctional, or flat out isn't produced in the first place. And that's essentially how certain genetic mutations lead to disease or lead to disease risk. So as far as terms that we use in the genetics world, again, just to make sure we're speaking the same language here, we talk about genotype. Um, the genotype is really the genetic makeup of either a cell or an individual. So we do genetic testing on somebody. We are looking, we are genotyping them. We are um, looking to see if the sequence of the genes um, that we're testing for is, is quote unquote normal. Contrast that with the phenotype. The phenotype is the observed traits of that cell or of that individual. Somebody may have a essentially normal genotype as far as looking at cancer risk genes, but still have a phenotype of cancer. They have normal genetic testing, yet they developed cancer. 
and vice versa, somebody may have a genotype that predisposes them to cancer, but didn't actually develop cancer themselves or hasn't yet developed cancer, and therefore their phenotype is a normal phenotype, essentially, or a cancer-free phenotype. So when we talk about mutations, when we talk about inherited mutations, we use the term germline. Um, and that's essentially um, uh, an indication that that mutation is within that individual, essentially throughout the whole body. That's, it's an inherited mutation somewhere in the DNA that's present essentially in every cell in that individual's body. They were born with it. They presumably inherited it from one of their parents. And they therefore have the potential to pass that on to their children um, because that mutation is present in the cells um, that, that that lead to conception, the sperms, the sperm, the oocytes. Um, contrast that with a somatic mutation, and this is what I was referring to before, an acquired mutation that's really present only in certain tissues. And in, in, the, in the world of cancer, we're talking about a mutation in a tumor or within a cancer. Um, those are mutations that are developing in mature cells. Um, these are, by definition, not inherited, cannot be passed on to children, um, are only present in the cells that actually acquire that mutation, and then the, the downstream cells um, when that cell divides and grows. Um, and these are, the cell, these are the mutations that we're typically looking for when we're talking about targeted therapies um, against a specific mutation. And that's particularly appealing because um, targeting something that's present in the cancer only theoretically should then um, be able to spare non-cancerous cells um, from the potential effects of those treatments, at least in theory. So when we talk about genetic testing, in my world, when, when I'm seeing somebody for inherited cancer risk, we're performing, by definition, germline genetic testing, testing the DNA that that person has inherited, um, and specifically testing for syndromes that increase cancer risk, that predispose to cancers. <clears throat> Contrast that with somatic genetic testing. When people talk about getting their tumor sequence, getting their cancer sequence, this is typically what we're talking about, and that's usually testing that's done on a cancer specimen, a biopsy or a tumor that's removed surgically. Now, what's a little bit tricky here is that testing, when you're testing a tumor specimen, you might actually pick up germline alterations because the, the testing isn't, you're still going to find inherited alterations within the tumor. You just need to contrast that with a normal non-cancerous uh, sample, such as a blood sample. Um, and so typically when we're looking within a tumor for, with somatic genetic testing, we're looking for specific mutations um, that one could target with a given therapy. And so now, going forward, I'm really going to focus on the inherited, the germline genetic testing um, and talk about um, hereditary risk. So why would somebody undergo germline genetic testing looking for something inherited? Um, we're really looking for um, the cancer or cancers for which an individual may be at risk. If we can identify that an individual has a specific sort of hereditary risk, we can then develop appropriate screening risk reduction strategies for that individual just as importantly then offer what we would call predictive testing to other family members to see who else might be at risk for cancer in that family. Um, and to a certain extent, um, even germline genetic testing can open the door to certain, um, a, a certain targeted therapies if that um, inherited alteration is felt to be important in how their tumor developed. The problem, and I think a lot of uh, medical professionals don't really appreciate this either, is that germline and inherited genetic testing rarely gives a true clear-cut black and white yes or no answer. People talk about, oh, I tested positive for the gene or I tested negative. It's a lot grayer than that. So when we talk about positive results, not all positive results are created equal. Um, if I'm testing somebody for 50 different genes and we get a quote-unquote positive result, um, first of all, just because somebody inherits an alteration in the cancer risk gene does not guarantee that that person is going to develop cancer. It's identifying odds and risks and trying to tell us what those odds are, but it's not a certainty. Um, oftentimes, for many of the genes that we test for nowadays, the actual degree of risk, the magnitude of risk, is not well defined. Sometimes the spectrum of cancers for which an individual may be at risk is not well defined. Sometimes we're finding things that really had nothing to do with why we were doing the genetic testing in the first place, and therefore it's a positive result, but it doesn't really explain the individual's history. I'm going to skip variants of uncertain significance for a quick second, talk about negative results. When somebody gets, quote unquote, negative results from their genetic testing, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's no risk. It may be that we just simply tested the wrong person in a family. If a family's got a lot of people with breast cancer and we, we test a, a relative who themselves hasn't had cancer, they get negative results, well, that's good. But it, there may still be something in the family, and we just happen to test somebody who didn't inherit the factor of concern. We may have tested for the wrong genes. There may be genes that we haven't discovered yet. And it may be that even with negative results, there's still enough risk in that family where some sort of specialized screening 
enhanced screening or even preventative surgeries may be considered in some cases. And then the one in the middle there, variants of uncertain significance, these are incredibly common, and this is probably um, the most important example of where genetic testing doesn't often give us a clear-cut answer. We find these variants of uncertain significance in roughly a third of people getting genetic testing, and what they are, it's a subtle typo in the DNA within a cancer risk gene, where by definition we don't know if that typo does a thing. It may not lead to any dysfunction in the gene, dysfunction in the proteins. It's usually one we haven't seen before, and so if we haven't seen, but seen it before, it's hard for us to definitively say that it's nothing versus it being something, and so we call it uncertain. Um, and these are a bit of a risk because you run the risk that somebody may misinterpret that, may overreact to it um, when it may truly be nothing and offer somebody aggressive screening or even aggressive surgery for something that actually has no meaning. So in a perfect world, we prefer to perform germline genetic testing, inherited genetic testing, on an individual in a family who's actually been affected with the cancer of concern. So this is a family tree, what we call a pedigree. Um, the squares are males, the circles are females. Um, each line here is a given generation. So this would be a mother, this would be her children, this would be her parents, these would be her siblings, this would be her parents' father, et cetera. Um, so this is a kind of a family tree or a map here. So if this person here shows up for genetic testing, they've got a strong family history, but they themselves um, have not been affected. If this person shows up for genetic testing and has negative test results, that's great for that individual, but it, it's what we would call an uninformative negative. It may be that we tested the wrong person in the family when there truly is inherited risk, or it could be that there's inherited risk and modern day testing just can't identify what that is. And so it's a little hard to counsel these individuals. Sometimes it, it, it just is what it is. The only person available for testing or the only person who wants testing is the person themselves who hasn't been affected. Um, but this is an example of where the results of testing are not always black and white. Where it can become quite a bit more black and white is once we find a, a mutation in the family, a mutation that we think we understand, a mutation that we think um, is really explaining the risk in that family, then we can kind of cascade that information throughout the family, offer testing for that same genetic factor to that person's siblings, their children, their parents, their relatives, and that's where we do really get a black and white answer. You either have it or you don't. And so once we know what factor in the family is, is causing um, the, cancer, uh, the cancer phenotype in that family, then we can offer what we would call single site testing. It's more truly informative. You either have it or you don't. It's quick, it's cheap, and it's kind of like a game of Where's Waldo. Once you, once you know where to look for it it, 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 it pops out to you every time and you can see that it's there or it's not. So when we talk about a positive gene uh, test on uh, germline genetic testing, you know, what does that mean for that individual, for that family? So once we find it, even though there can be some uncertainty, it really allows us to go through the family and identify who has risk, what those risks are, either specific cancer types, um, and, and how high those risks are. There's some uncertainty with all of these, but we can at least start to um, pin down what this means for that individual and that family. And just as importantly, develop specific, personalized, tailored strategies to manage that risk, to reduce that risk, all in the name of hopefully prevention and or early detection. So when an individual comes in for a genetic counseling visit at Dana-Farber, um, they typically meet with a genetic counselor um, as the first portion of this. A genetic counselor will, will draw out and create an extensive family tree, a bigger version of what I showed you before with the squares and the circles, encompassing both their mother's and their father's side of the family, looking at specific cancer diagnoses, ages at diagnosis, and sometimes other non-cancerous factors in the family. Um, there will be an extensive discussion about what the potential implications would be of a positive test or a negative test for that matter. It's usually a blood test, although um, nowadays there's also more saliva testing being done, sent off to a commercial laboratory. Um, usually a turnaround time of about four weeks, sometimes a bit quicker. Um, and nowadays we're typically testing for dozens and occasionally even hundreds of different cancer risk genes, many of which we don't understand all that well, to be honest, um, but the commercial labs keep adding more and more genes to their panels, almost as a bit of an arms race, if you will. Um, insurance coverage for genetic testing is pretty variable. Um, that said, it's become infinitely cheaper than it was um, when I first started doing this. Nowadays, if insurance denies the, um, genetic testing, most labs, the out-of-pocket costs are about $250, which is not cheap necessarily, but it used to be thousands and thousands of dollars just to have one or two genes tested, and nowadays it's about $250 to get dozens, if not hundreds, of genes tested. Um, so it's becoming a good deal more accessible. So I'm going to switch gears a little and now start talking about specific 
um, inherited syndromes linked to gastric gastroesophageal cancer. The first two really are the most important ones, and those are the ones I'll come to last. Lynch syndrome, which used to be known as HNPCC, which is a large fraction of what we do in the GI genetics clinic. Hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome, um, familial adenomatous polyposis, and an offshoot syndrome called GAPS. Lee Fraumani syndrome, juvenile polyposis syndrome, those would be the key ones um, that we think about when we're talking about inherited risks of gastric cancer. Um, so it's broken, broken down here um, in a table. Knowing the specific genes might not be all that relevant um, for this audience unless you're particularly interested, but they're listed here. Um, there are pretty variable risks of gastric cancer uh, syndrome to syndrome, and each of these syndromes actually looks quite different as far as the non-gastric cancer portions of these syndromes. I'll go into this um, in a little bit more detail detail um, going forward here. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the rarer ones. Um, so familial adenomatous polyposis, or FAP, this is a syndrome that's been known about for a long time, in part because it's a pretty striking syndrome. Um, the gastric cancer portion of FAP is actually considered one of the minor portions of the syndrome. The, the more dramatic um, aspect of this is people tend to uh, produce profuse polyps within their colon, within their large intestine, um, as early as the teenage years or early 20s. Um, it's not subtle. This is a picture from a colonoscopy. Every, all of these little lumps, bumps that you see here are polyps. Um, polyps are common, once people, especially once people get into their 50s, 60s, 70s. They're not common in the teens and 20s, and certainly polyps of this number and this size is extremely unusual. So these individuals often form hundreds, if not thousands, of polyps. They have a virtual certainty of developing colorectal cancer if you leave the colon in place, and so um, standard management for these individuals is surgery to remove the entire large intestine. Um, it's a rare syndrome, thankfully. It's caused by inherited mutations in a gene called APC. Um, stomach cancer, as I mentioned, is one of the more minor portions of this. The, the literature would suggest that the lifetime risk of stomach cancer in FAP is under 5%, although we're seeing it more and more, honestly. Um, and it's not terribly clear why. It, maybe we're preventing some of the other cancers. Um, and it, screening for stomach cancer in these individuals is particularly tricky, especially because these individuals mostly already have their colon removed. And so if we're then talking about surgery or some sort of intervention on the stomach, they already are coming into this with an altered GI tract. Um, other features of FAP can include desmoid tumors, which are an unusual tumor of essentially scar tissue that can be pretty debilitating, often develop within the abdominal cavity. These individuals are at risk for cancers in the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine coming off of the stomach, or polyps in that area. Um, fundic gland polyps of the stomach, which are actually quite common in individuals across the board outside of genetic syndromes, especially individuals who take acid-suppressing medications, but these are seen pretty strikingly in FAP. And then thyroid nodules or thyroid cancers, which are also pretty common outside of this syndrome. GAPS is a relatively recently recognized syndrome. This is an offshoot of FAP because it's caused by inherited alterations in the same APC gene, but in a very specific portion of the gene. Um, it's a bit of an unusual syndrome in that it does actually cause a pretty striking um, appearance within the stomach. Um, so the, the picture I showed you on the last slide was the colon. This is the stomach here, and this is a similar phenomenon where there's just profuse polyps. And this is in the, what we call the proximal stomach, the early portion of the stomach, just as it comes off of the esophagus. In this picture here, this is a scope, this black tube here, and this is really the junction between um, the esophagus and the stomach. So this is the early portion of the stomach, really just littered with polyps. And contrast that down here, this is the, the later portion of the stomach um, where there's no polyps. So GAPS um, really is a syndrome affecting the upper stomach, um, where there actually seems to be a pretty high risk of stomach cancer. This appears to be exceedingly rare, um, but um, is, is an example of um, sometimes where the location of the mutation within a given gene can cause very different appearance. Switching gears now, talking about another rare syndrome. Lee Fraumani syndrome is, is a syndrome that's been known for a long time. It was actually originally discovered by Fred Lee, um, who founded the, the Center for Cancer Genetics and Prevention here at Dana Farber. Um, this is, an, uh, as I mentioned, another rare syndrome. It's caused by inherited mutations in the TP53 gene. Now, TP53 is a gene that's very important in cancer biology. Um, it's very common for cancers to have somatic acquired mutations in TP53. Thankfully, it's rare to have inherited mutations, um, but this causes the pretty devastating syndrome of Lee-Fraumeni, where the lifetime risk of any cancer is exceedingly high. Gastric cancer is not considered one of the primary cancers, but it absolutely is part of the spectrum. Um, other features of Lee-Fraumeni typically typically include just simply having multiple cancers in one's lifetime, often at particularly young ages. Breast cancer is particularly common, unusual sarcomas, which are soft tissue cancers, 
brain cancers, um, again, thyroid disease, adrenal cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, um, and honestly, a longer list beyond that. But stomach cancer is part of the syndrome, and we do typically screen these individuals for stomach cancer. Um, these are two particularly rare syndromes that, that um, have some overlap with one another, poots jaeger syndrome and juvenile polyposis syndrome. The lifetime risk of stomach cancer in these syndromes is substantial, 20 to 30 percent. Um, there are other uh, manifestations elsewhere in the GI tract, um, cancers in the, in the large intestine, the colon, the rectum, as well as the small intestine. Um, these syndromes are both characterized by particularly unusual polyps in the GI tract, what we call hamartomas or juvenile polyps, and often that's part of what triggers the diagnosis, that, is that people are found to have these very bizarre polyps. Um, poots jaeger specifically has a pretty long list of other cancers linked to it, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, and some unusual types of cervical, ovarian, testicular cancers. And oddly, poots jaeger is one of the classic features um, that we see with this. I don't know how well this projects here, is freckling of the lips um, as well as of the genital mucosa. Now, this type of freckling can be seen outside of poots jaegers as well, but it is one of the hallmark features. Um, it often fades in adulthood, but it's something that we see particularly in children with poots Jaegers. So I'm going to switch gears now into some of, uh, and probably the two more important um, syndromes to know about when it comes to inherited gastroesophageal cancer. So Lynch syndrome is one that we deal with frequently in the cancer genetics clinic. This is not a rare syndrome. Um, it's felt to um, occur in as many as one in 300 individuals in the United States, meaning that there's over a million people in the U.S. who have this, most of whom actually don't know that they have this. Um, by definition, it's caused by inherited mutations in the five genes listed here. Um, the lifetime risk of gastric cancer, stomach cancer, varies by gene. Um, MLH1 and MSH2 are um, two of the uh, more classic types of uh, Lynch syndrome genes um, where the risk is felt to be um, particularly high, somewhere in the 8 to 10 percent range over somebody's lifetime. Um, contrast that with PMS2, which is probably one of the more common genes that we see in the general population where there may be no real link to stomach cancer. One hallmark feature here is that the cancers that develop in Lynch syndrome, including the stomach cancers, virtually always have a phenomenon called MSI, or what we call MSI high. Another name for that is MMR deficiency. Um, and these are features that we're nowadays testing for across the board in all sorts of cancer types, including gastroesophageal cancer, because these are features that predict for benefit from immunotherapy type agents. Um, and so we've known about MSI and mismatch repair deficiency for a long time in the Lynch syndrome world. Nowadays, the oncologists are much more interested in this um, from the standpoint of looking um, for the opportunities to use immunotherapy, but I would argue that any gastric or esophageal cancer that is found to be MSI high or mismatch repair deficient, that should trigger a workup for Lynch syndrome as well, even if there's not a classic history in the family. Um, so Lynch syndrome most, co most notably is associated with high lifetime risks of colon and rectal cancer, as well as uterine cancer or endometrial cancer. But there's a pretty long list of other cancers linked to Lynch syndrome, ovarian cancer, cancers of the urinary tract, including the bladder, cancers of the small intestine, the pancreas, the bile duct, um, some unusual tumors of the skin that we call sebaceous adenomas. As I mentioned, all of these cancers will, will pretty much universally have MSI high mismatch repair deficiency type of findings. Um, Lynch syndrome can look very different family to family, but I would argue um, we should be considering genetic testing for Lynch syndrome and anybody with a personal and or family history of these cancers, especially if there's known MSI high in one of the tumors. Um, and as far as how to screen for gastric cancer, gastric and esophageal cancer in individuals with Lynch syndrome, there's a number of national guidelines out there, and honestly, the, the recommendations are pretty variable. We, we, we don't have good quality data, unfortunately, to guide us as to who needs screening, how to do screening, or how to prevent these cancers. Um, there's no proven benefit that screening actually improves long-term outcome in Lynch syndrome carriers. We assume that, that there is benefit, we just haven't proven it yet. At a minimum, national guidelines would recommend that a one-time upper endoscopy be, be performed in Lynch syndrome carriers um, somewhere in the ages of 30 to 40, um, including a test for H. pylori. H. pylori is a bacteria that increases the risk for stomach cancer. It has nothing to do with Lynch syndrome. It's just when you find it, you can identify it, treat it, and help further reduce that individual's lifetime risk of stomach cancer. My own practice in Lynch syndrome is typically to perform upper endoscopies every three years. Um, these individuals are usually having colon 
small endoscopies on a yearly basis anyway, so it's not a terribly tough thing to add an upper endoscopy on to somebody's colonoscopy. People usually don't know the difference. They're under anesthesia anyways. Their, their bowel is already prepped. It's not a, it's not a huge uh, burden for them if they're already getting their colonoscopy. Um, we'll increase the frequency of that screening um, in individuals with Lynch syndrome if they also have a family history of cancer um, or if they have other prior abnormal findings on prior upper endoscopies. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about, I think, the, probably the most classic syndrome as it relates to um, hereditary gastric cancer, what we call hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, or HDGC. This isn't rare, but it's not common either. Um, this was first described in the late 1990s. It was first described in a large family of Maori uh, New Zealanders. Um, and this is um, one of the pedigrees, one of the family trees from that initial publication. This is a huge pedigree. I think I counted this before. I think there's nine generations on this. And I realize it's, it's pretty small and doesn't project well. But any of the shaded or um, darkened in circles and squares here are individuals from the same family affected with, with stomach cancer here. Um, and you can see it's quite a few people. And it also seems to kind of concentrate in certain portions of the family tree. Um, so this, has been, this syndrome has been linked to inherited mutations in a gene called CDH1. Now I will point out that somatic non-inherited mutations in CDH1 are actually quite common in stomach cancer. And so it's not at all unusual for somebody's tumor testing, there's tumor genetic testing to identify a CDH1 mutation, particularly if they have um, a subtype of gastric cancer that we call diffuse type or signet ring cell stomach cancer. Um, but, um, but inherited mutations are not common and, and cause this pretty profound syndrome. This syndrome is associated with particularly high lifetime risks of gastric cancer, anywhere from 40 to 80 percent. Also interestingly causes a pretty high lifetime risk of a specific subtype of breast cancer called lobular breast cancer in female carriers. So the type of stomach cancer that these individuals develop is what we call diffuse type or signet ring cell gastric cancer, which is a less common type of gastric cancer, the more common type being what we classify as intestinal type stomach cancer. And I suspect you'll hear more about this distinction later in the day. Um, in this syndrome, these um, stomach cancers often are young onset, um, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, although this doesn't follow the textbook. I've found this syndrome in people in their 60s and 70s. On the flip side, I've seen teenagers develop stomach cancer. Oops, let me flip back here. Um, there is a, an increased uh, lifetime risk of lobular breast cancer, which is a less common subtype of breast cancer um, versus the more common ductal breast cancer. Most breast cancers are ductal. Um, but lobular breast cancer in females should um, trigger at least a thought that maybe you're dealing with um, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer. Interestingly, some of these families um, who have um, CDH1 mutations will, will have cleft lip or cleft palate when they're born. This isn't a terribly common phenomenon in this syndrome, but it can be an interesting curiosity and can actually help identify who in the family carries the mutation. There may be a link to colorectal cancer with this syndrome. We're not sure if, if there is a link. It's a pretty weak link. Um, but one striking piece with this syndrome is we've proven that screening with endoscopies is not a very effective way to screen these individuals for stomach cancer. The standard management for people known to carry a CDH1 mutation is a prophylactic, a preventative total gastrectomy resection of the entire stomach. We don't know what the right age is for individuals to have this uh, surgery, which makes it pretty challenging to counsel people. Um, there is, because it's an uncommon uh, syndrome, the data are still kind of just slowly trickling in. This is a recent study only looking at 20 different individuals with CDH1 um, mutations, but they were looking at 20 individuals who were planning to undergo prophylactic surgery. But what did their stomachs look like before they underwent surgery? So they all got an upper endoscopy before going to the operating room. All had completely normal looking upper endoscopies. Nothing, nothing that you would point out as being abnormal in the stomach. But 60% of these individuals had microscopic cancer at the time of their surgery. Um, and I realize that um, looking at microscopic cancer might not be something that everybody's too comfortable with here. But, but this is from the paper here. So these kind of blobby cells that are light pink in the middle here, these rounded cells, this is the cancer. There's about five. It, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't realize. 
um, there's about five or six cells of cancer here. So this is the type of thing where um, the pathologist who removes the, the stomach um, needs to look meticulously through the stomach to look for these microscopic cancers here. But this, this kind of shows you why en endoscopies are not very effective in these individuals. Um, and I think a problem that we're seeing increasingly in the genetics world is when you kind of stumble upon one of these CDH mutations. I mentioned at the outset that genetic testing doesn't necessarily give you a black and white answer. Sometimes you're, you're identifying things you weren't really looking for. So this is a um, this altered for the sake of anonymity, a family that I've been following here at Dana-Farber um, recently. So um, the woman in the middle um, here came in for genetic testing mostly because of her family history of breast cancer. Um, there's no family history of stomach cancer here. She got a large panel done and was found to have a CDH1 mutation, which was a surprise. Um, her sister and her daughter were also tested, and all three of them were found to have a CDH1 mutation. There's no stomach cancer in this family. So th should these in individuals undergo a prophylactic total removal of their stomach in the absence of a known family history of, of stomach cancer? It's a challenging thing to counsel these people. All three of them did. All three of them did earlier this year, and all three of them had microscopic cancers found. In fact, they all had multi, uh, multiple microscopic cancers found at the time of their surgery. So we're still really learning what this means um, and what's the right age uh, to undergo this type of surgery. Um, some individuals choose not to undergo surgery. For those individuals, we recommend an extremely aggressive screening, not just an upper endoscopy, but an upper endoscopy with what we call Cambridge Protocol, um, named after researchers in um, Cambridge, UK, who uh, basically did this protocol where you biopsy the stomach randomly in predefined locations anywhere from 30 to 70 times during the same procedure. You give um, treatments ahead of time to reduce the mucus formation within the stomach so you can look extra carefully. Um, we don't know if this is all that effective although we have had early catches by, in people, especially young people, who weren't really ready to undergo gastrectomy, um, where we feel that we're at least able to offer them some degree of surveillance. Women with this, um, with this mutation are typically recommended to begin breast cancer screening at least by age 30. Some women choose to have preventative surgery to remove the breast tissue. Um, we consider colon cancer screening, although as I mentioned, that's a bit uh, complicated. And reproductive counseling, especially for young adults. This is a, a gene that if somebody has it, there's a 50-50 likelihood they would pass it on to their future children. I'm going to skip over this for the sake of time, but just to close, so who should undergo genetic testing if, if they've got a diagnosis of gastric or esophageal cancer? Honestly, it's not entirely clear. We don't have good quality guidelines to guide this. The guidelines we have are specific to individual syndromes, and we don't have great quality data about how common these genetic mutations are if you look at all comers with gastric or esophageal cancer. I would leave you with my thoughts, which are, um, just how I approach people um, with gastric or esophageal cancer who should undergo genetic testing, certainly anybody who's diagnosed at a young age, especially if there's a signet ring or diffuse type histology um, to their cancer. Anybody with gastric cancer who also has a family history of gastric cancer, all the more so if there, it's known that there was a signet ring cell or a diffuse type histology. Anybody with gastric cancer who themselves had breast cancer or a family history of breast cancer, if there was a personal or family history of a cleft lip or cleft palate, personal or family history of multiple other cancers, um, especially young onset cancers, colon cancer, uterine cancer, or if there's a finding of mismatch repair deficiency and MSI high um, within the tumor. So in summary, both inherited and acquired genetic changes are important in underlying cancer biology. There's a pretty wide diversity of syndromes that we look at that can predispose to gastric and esophageal cancer with varying biology, varying degrees of risks, and varying approaches to how we manage these people from just simple screening to aggressive surgery. And effective prevention is available for individuals and families with these various syndromes, including, I think, the, the most uh, notorious of them, um, CDH1, um, where there's a pretty high lifetime risk of stomach cancer. So happy to take questions, um, and thanks for listening. Great. Thank you, Matt. So we have time for maybe one or two questions, um, and uh, please write down your questions on the index cards because we have a full half hour before lunch um, to, to ask questions. But maybe just one question. Yes, the gentleman here. <clears throat> I'm interested in the significance of doing the H. pylori bacteria testing for patients who have Lynch syndrome. Is that because patients with Lynch syndrome um, may have it because of the H. pylori, 
or the it, H. pylori it, causes it? Neither one. It, it's, they're, they're actually completely <clears throat> unrelated. It's simply that H. pylori is common, and H. pylori itself increases the risk for stomach cancer. So it's what we would call a modifiable risk factor. You can't modify your genes. But if there's something that, that might be compounding that inherited risk to stomach cancer, such as an H. pylori infection, if we can identify that that person has H. pylori, treat it, eradicate it, we're reducing that person's risk of stomach cancer, even though they still have the inherited risk as well. So th there's, there's no cause and effect. There's no link to the two. It's just something that's easy to check for. And the, are you saying there is a link, a causal link, of H. pylori significantly to the cause of stomach cancer? Yes, that, that there is. H. pylori is, is, a, is a pretty well-described risk factor for stomach cancer. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, save your questions for the panel discussion. Thank you again, Matt. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. John Wee, um, who is uh, one of our premier surgeons from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, he leads our robotic uh, center and also is a co-director of the Minimally Invasive uh, Center, and uh, he will be